Come on, Duffy. Maybe Wilco could fix this old table instead of me. Well, maybe not, but we sure have the tools to help you do it. Famous quality Black & Decker power tools, Luck & Tape measures, Stanley tools, and to help you clean up a mess. Back. Got to have a low price. Bob, what else would you expect from Wolco? Come on, God, and well, smile. Then, Wolco really is me. Bob Duffy, Wolco is the department store that's all you. Come on, shop the Wolco way. Take a value home today. Good morning. The marathon in Victoria adjourned a few minutes ago to give the MLAs all the rest they need until 10 a.m. when the House sits again. It was a quiet night, really, last night, only punctuated by two events. The routine expulsion of Frank Howard of the NDP and a unanimous vote of observers that up to now the loudest and longest snorer in the legislature no cuddly bears there last night, but the loudest, the award for the loudest and longest and noisiest snorer during debates is Don Campbell, a new social credit backbencher from the Okanagan. So this morning we're going to give you some light-hearted coverage of affairs, both federal and provincial. But we're going to start in Victoria with Gordon Hansen, NDP member who's going to talk about, give us some inside chitty chat on the public accounts and hotel bills and moving expenses and the kind of things we like to know about. And then we're going to have a little gossip with Bill van der Zam's alter ego, not politically, but physically in the Surrey riding. An old friend of mine, Rita Johnson. And then, what do you know? Sven Robinson is back for more minor punishment. And after that, we're going to be change pace and be quite serious because, as you know, I did a little semi-documentary on Cradlehaven, with which I was very impressed. With me this morning will be Alec Mansky, the executive director of the British Columbians for Mentally Retarded, to suggest what might still be done, perhaps, and Dr. Sally Rogo of UBC Special, Special Education. Oh, and later on, we're going to have a laugh with Charlie Harron. Think that one out and you'll get it. Charlie Harron. After the break. First of all, the record, I just want to give you uh, a video detail of the expulsion of uh, Frank Howard from the house last night. Uh, he'll probably tell us what the reasons were. There have been a number of expulsions. I think it's just for the one session. That's all it will be. And here's Howard to our cameras. Why were you thrown out of the house? I think because the government has got a timetable of some nature. It wants to ram through the legislature, all night sittings, its legislation, any way it can. And I think I'm regretfully the chairman, and I don't say it disrespectfully of the, the person, I think regretfully the chairman has got himself wrapped up in this. He doesn't understand what democracy is all about. And he takes the first opportunity to close off debate and to prevent people from talking about, you know what we're talking about? The Spetafor bill, private profit greed, a bill to serve private interests. But you, there wasn't a formal closure motion. What are you talking it's, about? It's closure by a different method. It's, it's a closure of this nature. Shut up said the chairman and said you frank howard are not going to be able to speak anymore on this particular bill get out next topic is the door open for talks with tubi or is it not that's bc fed or is it not open we've seen mr bennett say he's not going to change the legislation i want to give you um, big bob mcclellan on that particular aspect so we can understand the government view 
Yesterday, Premier Bennett said the government would not bargain on its legislation, but you seem to be saying well, that there could be some negotiation. No, you know, of course we're not going to bargain, and I've said there'd be no blackmail and there'd be no intimidation. We're not going to sit down with someone who says, uh, look, uh, it's going to be all our way uh, or we don't sit. But uh, if people come with an open mind and an, and an open opportunity to talk, uh, then we will they, we'll be able to sit down and talk and negotiate. Uh, I think it's, we've made it pretty clear that the major thrust of our legislation uh, is important and uh, must be carried through if economic recovery is to take place in this province. Uh, but obviously there are, there are some areas that perhaps could be changed if someone would sit down and show us where they need to be changed. There were mentions uh, yesterday about uh, Bob McDonald's expenses in the Hotel Vancouver. And I had previously arranged to have Gordon Hansen come and tell me about the Public Accounts Committee. At least we think we know what's going on there. But first, McClellan gives a part of his explanation. I referred Mr. Hansen, too, to the uh, Constitution Act in B.C., which says that a cabinet minister's uh, place of residence officially is in Victoria. I lived in Victoria, and yet, uh, in fact, I lived in Victoria uh, for, the, for about seven years while I was a cabinet minister, and uh, yet much of my business was done in Vancouver. And uh, I spoke uh, two, three nights a week at uh, some kind of a function, uh, either that or meetings with uh, groups of people of one kind or another when I was health minister and when I was energy minister and later uh, as labor minister, although I don't live in Victoria anymore. But uh, during that time, uh, I had to stay someplace when I was in Vancouver. And I liked the Hotel Vancouver. They gave a very, very good corporate rate. I think around $45 a night compared to about $100 a night regularly. So I thought that was a pretty good deal. Uh, and uh, I don't know where Mr. Hansen expected me to sleep, but I, uh, I think the Hotel Vancouver is a reasonably good hotel. Did you have to use the aircraft quite as much as you did use it? Oh, Over 100 times? Well, I, I, I haven't seen the uh, vouchers to which Mr. Hansen refers. I'd love to look at them, but uh, I've never used the aircraft for anything except for legitimate government business. Kind of reverse order, but a welcome to Gordon Hansen in our Victoria studio this morning. You had raised the questions in the public accounts, but before we turn to Mr. McClellan, there was one thing you dug up which I found quite fascinating in these days of restraints. Um, how much in the way of moving expenses does the government pay for some of its specially hired people? Uh, Mr. Kinsella received $10,000 without any uh, receipts to come from Ontario. Um, Mr. Uh, Douglas Heal got $13,100. There are many people in British Columbia that make that amount in a year. Uh, that's rather excessive. There are no expense uh, receipts uh, attached to those vouchers, Jack. But and will they? Act let me let me explain first of all. This information you get as an active member of the Public Accounts Committee, in which mm -hmm. you can call f at this particular time for the bills for eighty one, eighty two. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, there are three members of the opposition that are entitled to sit and, and review the actual spending of the government. I'm one. Dennis Koch and Lord Nicholson are others. Uh, we, I wish that uh, you could come with me and we could have a show, you could sit beside me and we could go through the vouchers and just see the lifestyle that this particular government and the cabinet ministers in particular uh, enjoy. Uh, at the same time, they're making pronouncements now about how they are the epitome of restraint and uh, how they take away $50 from the disabled people per month who work 20 hours a month to get that, uh, take away $150 a month from the tenants of this province, and yet you'll s you would see with me the kind of spending habits that Mr. McClellan was referring to. He could have uh, rented an apartment in Vancouver for $500 a month. Instead, he stayed in the Hotel Vancouver for 100 days in, uh, in the fiscal year under question and used the government jet 140 times to commute back and forth. I think that's excessive. And when I hear him saying that the poor people in the province should tighten their belt, I, I, I question that. Now, uh, did he say 45 bucks a night at the hotel? That's a good rate, good corporate rate. Mr. Uh, McClellan's uh, rate was varied between 45 and 60, but the thing that uh, intrigues me, Jack, is that then he qualifies for a per diem because he's not in his constituency. If, if he'd gone to Langley <coughs> and uh, had, a, had a small apartment or had a hotel there, he would not have qualified for his per diem. So he had a hotel 
room at the taxpayer's expense. He had a $45 per day per diem in excess of his salary. He even stayed there Christmas Eve and Christmas Day at the taxpayer's expense, which uh, seems a bit odd. But we must give our uh, <coughs> cabinet ministers the dignity and the affluent surroundings to which they become accustomed. And was that not the same in the old NDP days? Not at all. Can you imagine Dave Barrett uh, lounging away in the Hotel Vancouver 100 days a year? You've, you've talked to Dave Barrett and the other NDP cabinet ministers, or Dave Stupich. Can you see them doing that? Not at all. These people are, were really enjoying their status as cabinet ministers. And of course, this is all pre-Peter Heinemann expenditure, so we have pure uh, cabinet minister behavior here, unadulterated by any kind of no, uh, a, no, There's not a drop of fui, fuisi involved in this one, is there? Oh, there's lots of very large dinners and, uh, and uh, relaxation, Jack. I've just been focusing, because we're sitting 24 hours a day, I haven't had a chance to do too much work. This is just two, two or three hours' work. I've determined that Mr. McClellan used the government jet 140 times in a year and uh, stayed in the Hotel Vancouver 100 days. Uh, he went out and had pictures taken of himself. There is a government photographer who's taken my picture, who's taken uh, most of the government, uh, or sorry, uh, opposition members' photographs, uh, quite capable. You know, he knows what an f-stop is and, you know, what a depth of field is. Uh, Mr. McClellan had to go to somebody in Vancouver and spend almost $3,000 on 400 photographs of himself. What were they used for? Did you ask him? Well, this doesn't say, this isn't indicated in the... Okay, uh, back to the you, you regard that even though uh, they had more money then, they were still profligate. Jack, uh, when times were good in this province, this government didn't set anything aside. The uh, spending habits uh, of the cabinet ministers, both personal and, and in terms of policy matters, they didn't send any money aside. And now what are they doing? They're hacking and cutting at the bone and the very muscle of our social fabric. I get the point, but let me get back to Kinsella's moving expenses. Certainly. Was that a $10,000 grant by order and council or something properly to allow him to move from Ontario to BC? I yes. mean, the guy was being hired. He's entitled to moving expenses. Yes, yeah, so he just got a nice letter from Mr. Bennett uh, appointing him at $65,000 a year plus $10,000 a year in uh, various benefits, plus, ten th plus the $10,000 to assist him in all yeah, of the know, discomfort I'm, in getting here. I'm not screaming about it. I just like to know, you know. Now, what about uh, Doug Hill, the communications, to use that dreadful media word, czar? I don't speak to the guy, but they tell me he's a communications czar. Uh, what about him? What did he get in the way of moving expenses? His was in the previous fiscal year, and he received $13,100, so he wasn't But he too had to come from California, I thought. Am no, I right? No, he came from Toronto. Oh, from Toronto. Mm -hmm. oh. But you see, the average person uh, hired by the government uh, may get some modest uh, uh, expense claim to offset uh, perhaps a real estate fee or something like that. But $13,100, unless he was living in a half-million-dollar house, and why should the taxpayer pay that anyway? Oh, he probably was. Don't forget, he's a big shot. Now, Gordon, don't want to get into politics this morning. How long before you collapse in exhaustion and say, please apply closure and let's all go on holiday? I think once you achieve a certain level of fatigue, you can maintain it indefinitely. And I think that's where we are at the moment. We're, <laughs> we're going to continue to oppose what we call the dirty dozen. They are bills that hurt poor people, the, work, the workers of this province, the tenants, the elderly, and so on. We can't step aside, Jack. Uh, we have to do our duty, and uh, clearly the government is going to use their force of, of the majority to take, to take those bills by closure. Thank you very much, Gordon Hanson, NDP Victoria. Thank Next you. we're going to have a little chatty poo with uh, my old friend Rita Johnson, social credit MLA from Surrey, after the break.
see this player from Lake Shore who was concerned about touching her glasses. So Do you want me to take them off? Do you uh, feel comfortable with them? Uh, it doesn't bother me. Certainly solves the problem quickly. <laughs> I can't see, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Do you see the monitor all right? What monitor? This oh, television? Sure. Yeah. And these guys. And I've seen him before. Good morning, Rita. Good morning. When did we first meet? Oh, I would say in the early 1970s. 70s? Mm -hmm. When you were an alderman in Surrey? Right. What made you run for any government? Why do you want to punish yourself like this, even though you are a young woman? At this time in the debate, I'm asking myself the same question. What do you think of it? Honestly, just give me a pretend that Premier Bennett's people aren't taping this and give me an honest opinion of what you found when you went into the house where some of your colleagues have cuddly teddy bears and we nominated the loudest snorer and the NDP are just as bad, don't misunderstand me. What do you think of them? Bunch of idiots? No, I'm, I'm really concerned with the, um, the, the lack of, of decorum in the house and it's certainly a change from uh, sitting on city council. I used to think that uh, we had problems in Surrey on council well, but you uh, did certainly have they're a fine example of, of uh, parliamentary procedure as compared to what goes on in this legislature. Nothing you can do about it. You're behaving properly, I trust. I, I would expect that I am. You haven't fallen asleep in your chair? I wouldn't go so far as to say that. Okay, now what about the legislation? I mean, you're used to argy-bargy. You've, you've been a fighter all your life. You know, I, I'm prepared to say let the, govern, go, let the government govern, but aren't they overdoing it just a smidgen? I don't think they're overdoing it at all um, in the way that I believe you're suggesting. I think we're overdoing it in other ways. You know, um, uh, you, you are aware of the fact that I, I put forward a motion that brought in closure the other night. No! And it seems to me that after uh, 15 hours of debate on a bill and five hours uh, on a hoist, um, and a accomplishing absolutely nothing, uh, I arrived at the conclusion that uh, it was almost government by the minority and uh, the arguments put forward by the official opposition, uh, they weren't relevant and, and it was repetitious and, and it was really getting uh, really boring. What and we're bill spending, were you on? What, we're what, spending what? hundreds of thousands of dollars every week to, to put on what must be the best show in Victoria, and we're really not getting the work done. We're not getting the job done that we were elected to do. Yes, I know, but is there no rational, there's certainly not much information, said he, modestly and respectfully, coming out of your government. We don't know what's in the, what the legislation means yet in half of the major bills. I mean, well, you, I could ask you questions about Bill 2 or Bill 3, you couldn't answer. I think those questions could be properly put to the ministers and they would be able to answer them very adequately. I think the problem as I see it, Jack, and I have been watching, uh, I've caught the odd uh, morning uh, program uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the Webster show, and certainly I think what you have to do is come over here and see it yourself in person. I think you're talking to people like uh, Marjorie Nichols and the Alan Gars in Victoria. Oh, I would never and speak you're to not Alan getting Gar the facts. Please, withdraw that insult. <laughs> Talk to Marjorie, yes, but not to Alan Gar. Don't be silly. Okay. Matter of fact, though, seriously, I spent a month studying the bills, speaking to as many government officials as I could, and analyzed them as best I can. But Premier Bennett won't come on the show. Jimmy Chabot dodges me all the time. I had a routine one with Nielsen. I'm not quite sure of the answers he gave me because he doesn't know any legitimate reporters. And I won't forgive you for that one for a while, Jimmy Nielsen. <laughs> I don't like these personal snarky things. 
and your closure of the corridor to the, to the television cameras was just childish. I can't understand that, um, uh, what I have heard about that action myself because the cameras were in the corridors again this morning, so oh, uh, good. I don't really know what it was, that, what oh. action the speaker took, well, because I'm still tripping over the cords every time I try to get out the doors. Well, you can always sue BCTV if you're seriously injured. Feel free. Anyway, how long is it going to last, uh, uh, Rita? Well, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to uh, reach an agreement with the opposition and that we are going to get down to business. I'd like to see us go right through this weekend and continue going until we get some of the work done that we were sent here to do. But, you but can't if do we that. don't, we're going to be here till Christmas. You can't do that night and day. Even a, an intelligent person like myself couldn't give intelligent debate if you're on your feet 24 hours a day. I mean, well, that's you know, silly. Even, even before we were on our feet 24 hours a day, just to give you an example, Jack, we had a member of the opposition who spoke for between 10 and 15 minutes on a bill and then addressed the speaker and said, which bill are we dealing with, Mr. Speaker? So that tells you the level of debate that we're faced with in the House. What was the bill that you uh, used the, the closure motion on? Eleven. But it wasn't the bill itself. It was on the hoist amendment. Well, there were still four speakers left to you go. We didn't cut them off. You know perfectly well everybody supports Bennett on Bill 11. But all he had to do was make it, instead of forever and a day, make it for a year and renew it every year as required. And there wouldn't be there wouldn't have been the slightest quibble about 11. Well, that type of discussion will come up in committee. But, I mean, you, <laughs> you can't be going 20 and 30 hours on every single solitary bill. We were elected on May the 5th, and we made some commitments during the election campaign. We're attempting to carry out those commitments, but we're, we're just being stopped every time we make a move. And we've got to take steps to ensure that the legislation is put forward. But it has to be after um, uh, adequate debate. But debate. my God, you know, 15 hours is much more than adequate in my opinion. Well, I always take my lead from Premier Bennett. And I'm, when I criticize the government, I'm supporting Premier Bennett's total philosophy. You know what that is? Come on, you know what it is. Tell me what it is. Not a dime without debate. You haven't even called the estimates, have you? No, we haven't even started on them. I think it'll be next spring before you're finished. Well, probably. I hope we'll have a couple of days off for Christmas, but... Uh, no, you don't I'm, deserve I'm it. I'm here for as long as it takes us to do the job, and if we have to, um, have to do that by going around the clock, well, that's what we're going to do. Thanks. Nice to see you, Rita. I will say with reservations, the best of luck. Thank you. My thanks to Rita Johnson, Social Credit, MLA for Surrey. Next, uh, Sven Robinson. <laughs> After the break. I do my best to like Sven Robinson, the NDP MP for Burnaby, but he makes it very difficult indeed. Why did you have to take such a cheap shot and insult the British Prime Minister in such a cheap way. I don't recall insulting the British Prime Minister, uh, Jack. Yes, uh, you did. I think uh, perhaps you... You refused to get up in your seat with the common courtesy of almost every other member in the House, and you sat there like a dummy, insulting the leader of the United Kingdom, addressing the joint, address, joint, joint parliaments. I stand and applaud for people whose views I respect, Jack. And I, you may disagree with that, but certainly that's my philosophy, and I think that the views of Margaret Thatcher, both uh, on international policy and domestic policy, are, are not views that I share. Did and your I think leader that, stand and applaud? No, he did not. He Mr. was not Broadbent? in the House. He was not present in the House. How many other members of the NDP sat there like spoiled little children without the common courtesy to give a technical to the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, a nation which has been a great friend of this country for many years under all governments. That's beside the point. I don't give oh. technical little clap, clap, claps. I try to be honest in my dealings, Do you Jack, stand for uh, O Canada? Do, of course I stand for O Canada. Do you stand for, for God Save the Queen? Of course I stand for God Save the Queen. Do you stand for Margaret Thatcher? No, I do not stand for What Margaret other politicians do, would uh, you not stand for? Would you stand, for example, for Ferdinand Marcos if he addressed the British House of Parliament would you, or the Canadian House of Parliament? Would you stand for Jaruzelski, the Polish uh, no. president? No. No. Oh, well, okay. Then it's no, right. I wouldn't. Fair enough. Now, I would stand for Ronald Reagan, and you wouldn't. 
That's quite correct. You'd sit there That's in your petty correct. little way and insult the nation under whose shelter and umbrella we live in comparative peace and comfort. No, I stand for people that I, I and respect. And you, you insulted the elected leader of a true democracy, one of the truest democracies in the world today, the United Kingdom. Let me tell you one of the reasons that I didn't stand for her, Jack. Tell me one of the reasons. There are 60,000 pensioners from Britain in this country that you may know something mm -hmm. about and Margaret Thatcher has refused to allow them a decent standard of living. They're living in poverty. Let me put that in accuracy. That is not correct. That is quite correct. These pensioners do not get the cost of living increases to the British pensions after they leave the United uh, Kingdom. That's correct. Attempts have been made by Canada and Britain to negotiate an agreement. Maggie Thatcher has refused. Callaghan also refused. Maggie Thatcher has refused. Callaghan also refused. Well, I, Callaghan didn't appear in front of the British. Oh, no, of course he didn't. But you see, you just think, and this is the reason you wouldn't stand for Maggie Thatcher. I think that those pensioners have a right to a decent standard of living, and I certainly disagree fundamentally. Certainly they should, and Britain should pay them the cost of living. That's right. Well, maybe that helps to get How many pensioners have we got, say, from Italy in this country? I don't know the exact number of pensioners. How Italy many like Canadians that? draw pensions in Italy? Would I you don't please read look, that for me that and not, show you some of the imbalance? That's not a relevant question, Jack. The and fact of the matter is that Margaret Thatcher's views could threaten the survival of this planet, and I stand And Regan's. And Regan's, and I stand and for people. And Trudeau's. And I stand for people. And I, I, don't stand, I don't stand for Trudeau. Do you? Would you stand for Trudeau? Of course I would stand for the Prime Minister of, of this country. Well, I understand you get along very well when he appears on Well, not show. as well as you get on with him, mm -hmm. I understand. No, well, that's not the case. Of course I would. would you wouldn't stand for Prime Minister Trudeau. If he appeared in our parliament, I don't respect uh, the uh, views. I think he's driving this country into a very dangerous situation. I wouldn't you stand talking about for Trudeau? Him. Of course. We don't stand for On him. On a, a special occasion, though, I'm we talking about. We don't stand Don't you show common courtesy to people who are elected by a majority? The fact of the matter is that I try to be honest in my dealings oh. with people, Jack, and you may not understand that. May no, that I may don't. not be political, but I believe that you stand for people whose views you respect. I wouldn't now, stand for Stalin. There's other, no. Surely there are other issues I that are more important than whether or not I stood for Margaret Thatcher. No, 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 no. Because I know what all your other issues are. You can never quite get your policies clear, but you're a very good publicity seeker. So I always like to have a little thing to argue with you about. And I think you're not standing for Margaret Thatcher was callous, utter rudeness of the worst order. Well, I disagree, of course, with you, but that's not the first time. It's nice to be back. <laughs> more, more with Sven. <laughs> No, I won't say it. After the break. Sven wants to talk about the security bill. By and large, I think, believe it or not, I agree with Sven and Bill C-157. But I want people to call now and give either of us hell about my views on Thatcher. I think Sven was rude. He thinks he is a man of principle who did the right thing. For Stalin, Lenin, Fidel Castro, any of your socialist friends in Eastern Europe. I just finished down saying, the now, look, now just a minute, let's get the record straight. I just finished saying I would not stand for Jaruzelski of Poland. Nor would you. No. I stand for people whose views I respect. And Margaret Thatcher is a woman with whom you would not shake hands. I didn't say that. We're not talking would about shaking shake hands. hands That's that? an irrelevant question. We're no, talking about not. standing, for heaven's sake. God, there was a famous British Columbia official called PC Power Commission who made his name by refusing to shake hands with Helmut Kjaer. Keenly sight. Mm -hmm. But that's before you were born. Mm. Are they on Thatcher? Yes, they're on Thatcher. Who's right and who's wrong, Robinson or Webster? Go ahead, please. Hello? That's you, ma'am. Yes, well, you're right, of course, Jack. And I, mm. think, he's a, I think he's a bigoted little biased so-and-so. Thank you, ma'am. Oh. Isn't that lovely? Oh. <laughs> you have five seconds to respond. Oh. Are you bigoted and biased? I, I may be biased, I'm not bigoted. Okay. Uh, hello? Who, who's right, Robinson or Webster? Robinson is right in as much as he's always stood for his NDP policies and he's honest about things. Thank you, sir. You know, no need to reply to that. No, what's your reply to that? Then? Don't spoil the program. Go ahead, please. There's no need for to stand up for people that are causing killings and she's a warmonger, a killer. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, please. 
Doc, I'm addressing to, uh, this to you facetiously. You big bully, how dare you savage the no defunct party's pride and joy like that? Well, it used to be the pride and joy. He's not ben quite Robinson, as high in the standing. You creep. No uh, black armbands this time, Robinson? Oh, yeah. Did you wear the black armband for Regan? Filthy creep. I'm sorry. I... Did you wear... He called you a filthy creep, but I oh don't believe goodness. that. I say no. Uh, did you wear the black armband when Regan spoke to the House? At the time that Regan spoke to the House of Commons, uh, he, his government was in the process of butchering thousands of people in El Salvador. And in my, as an indication of my strong views on that, in fact, I did uh, wear a black armband. Yes. You don't want the American protection in any way, shape, or form against the hated Russians and the Jarosovskis. Oh, the what utter rubbish, Jack! And if you don't understand that that's rubbish, then you're certainly uh, losing touch with reality. Who's right, Robinson or Webster? Oh, Webster's right, very, very much so. I think this young man here has a lot to learn, and if he doesn't have the respect for his his peers in Parliament, then uh, he should consider another career because there's a lot more to being childish than. Um, okay, that's enough. That somebody doesn't like you, you may respond to that. Well, I mean, it's got nothing to do with being childish, as I say. For better or for worse, I think it's important to be honest in politics, and I don't see why I should stand and applaud the views of someone who's basically, I believe, uh, is uh, is posing a profound threat to the survival of this planet. She's backing at her American allies. That's all she's doing. She's doing a lot more than that. She took advantage of that platform in Parliament in, a, in, a, in an inappropriate way to basically to put forward a, a doctrine which I think is very, very dangerous. She's a tough woman, though. Of course she's, she's terrific. Tough. Of course she's tough. She's just terrific. Even though I don't support her, I, I think she's terrific. We could do with a woman like that for Prime Minister of this country. It'd be a big improvement on anything we've got on the lines now, whether it's Broadbent, Mulroney, or Pierre. Uh, Robinson. Go ahead, please. Jack, I agree with what you said. And Mr. Robinson, um, to answer uh, what you just said previously, Margaret Thatcher is a head of state. As such, I think she deserves that respect. A democratic head of state. That's right. And now I'll tell you something else. As far as you called her a warmonger, which I think is totally unjustified, and it's unfortunate that it took the lives of 268 people Aboard a, aboard a jetliner to possibly get the Western world to finally realize you cannot bargain with the Russians. You cannot, you know, who's the warmonger? Take a good look at history. Take a look for, oh, at 33 years of Russian lies, Russian deceits. They will tell you what you want to hear and do exactly what they want. Thank you. And you certainly wouldn't well, stand no, for no, any no. Russian ambassador, would you? Well, certainly not. Uh, the, issue, the issue is that, uh, uh, for example, she is strongly supporting the uh, sighting of Pershing-2 and cruise missiles in Europe. Uh, she supports the Canadian testing of the cruise missile. I believe that is wrong. She believes in a common democratic view that the balance of terror is the only way to hold Russian aggression in check. Well, how many times over do we have to be able to kill one another before we come to our senses and put an end to this She ar can't arms change race? it. Go ahead, from Agassiz. I agree with Sven. Good. And yet I'm not uh, NDP, and uh, to me, it's Trudeau all the way, but I certainly agree with Sven. No, to, uh, he's a really, you, you'll join the Liberals one day, I suppose. Oh, over my dead body. When the NDP Over disappears. my dead body. You're a lot closer to the Liberals than I am, Jack. Oh, I would agree on that. But all I do in these kind of programs is try and create warmth and friendliness for your next election. <laughs> yes, I remember the last time I was here and you created a little warmth and friendliness. Yeah, well, I'm not even going to embarrass you by asking about that again. No. I had my pound of flesh and your party still doesn't... Warmth and friendliness. Like yeah, well, I'm not even going to embarrass oh, you by asking about that again. No. I had my morning, pound of flesh and your party still doesn't know whether it's punched a board in that topic. Go ahead from Williams Lake. Good morning, Jack. Good morning, Sven. Good morning. I have to agree with Jack. There is respect for a head of state of the Democratic nation. And whether we agree or not agree with any policy they may adhere to, we wouldn't be standing up for very many people. Go ahead, please. We're running pretty close. It's five in my favor and three against you. You don't uh, really stand call. Up for Go ahead, please. I you don't think that he is right. Uh, you don't only stand up for the person personally. You stand for respect for the office in which they hold. You're taught that when you're a little child. And that's common courtesy. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. You're losing. No, well, the fact of the matter is that I initially stood for Margaret Thatcher as she entered Parliament because I respected the office. I listened to what she had to say to us, assembled in that house of stand. Uh, and applaud her when I felt that what she was saying was, was something that I didn't agree with. 
everybody has to. If we, if we all told the truth at all times, there would be nobody alive in this studio or on this planet. You know that. The human being is a naked ape, hell-bent for self-destruction. Go ahead, please. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good I morning. must agree with Mr. Robinson. You must agree with him. I certainly must agree with Mr. Robinson. And to say that Mrs. Thatcher was a guest in our country, that is debatable as to who invited her. I certainly didn't, and I certainly think I'm a taxpayer. I did not invite this lady into this country. However, I was, by accident of birth, born and raised in England. However, I believe that Mr. Robinson must be congratulated for his stand. And Mr. Webster, please remember that even though she was a guest in our country, and you feel that Mr. Robinson may not be right in treating a guest in that way, remember the last time Mr. Robinson was on your show? I don't believe that you treated him with the kind of decorum that you should have treated a guest. Sometimes these oh, tactics no, no, are necessary. No, that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> you are trying to say what somebody else does is wrong, but what you do is right. That's Sven knows I'm perfect. No. <laughs> Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, six, four, ten. Go ahead, please. All right, well... More people will talk about this interview than if I allowed you to ramble on endlessly about the stupidities and inconsequential legislation and the short-sighted half-wittedness of the government legislation bill C-157. It's always a pleasure to be on with you, Jack, no matter what the How much more time do I have? 30 seconds. Go ahead, please. Okay, Jack. Well, as usual, but certainly not always, you're correct. Uh, one Whoa. thing I'd like to comment on, though, is your comparison, though, with Miss Thatcher and Mr. Nixon, and I don't think that's proper. I think that you should put this in a Canadian context. Okay, that makes it six to five. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you, very man. grateful indeed for the courtesy of having you here this morning. Nice and I would stand you. up if it were Margaret Thatcher or the Prime Minister, and I hope you're never the Prime Minister, although you will have a successful career in the House of Commons. Of that, I am sure. I'm standing for you right now, Jack. That's because I dragged you out. <laughs> Take the <laughs> microphone off before you leave. After the break. <laughs> <laughs> about the soccer ball. It starts at four, not at six. And remind me to do it in the last break. Seven, six, five. Well, I've got to change my mood and, of course, my whole thinking for the next couple of segments. Oh, dear. The other day, I took a camera crew out to Cradlehaven. And I took it out after Coroner Askey had done an investigation over some period of time into uh, the deaths of 11 children from the beginning of 1982 at Cradlehaven. And I read Askey's report, and I took the basic information from Askey's report that uh, due to public demands, the chief coroner ordered an inquiry into the 11 deaths at Cradlehaven. And uh, it said, by and large, it gave it a pretty clean bill of health and reviewed all the individual deaths. And there's just one other thing I want to point out to here, that there had been, allegations had been made that the general care of these children contributed to their deaths, and thus the whole aspects of care had to be looked at rather than just the immediate event prior to each death. Cradlehaven is a private institution under the direction of the Ministry of Human Resources for the care of the profoundly retarded youngsters, many of whom have very serious associated physical and other problems. Now, the spur for the inquiry into Cradlehaven was the British Columbians for the mental retarded, of which the executive director is Al Mansky. Now, I must tell you, uh, Al, and with, by the way, with Alan Mansky, is Dr. Sally Orrogo, who is a special education professor at, on the faculty at QBC. I must tell you that when I went out that day, that I was very impressed with the, the humanity, the cleanliness, the atmosphere of all that I saw there, 
because I've been around long enough to have seen the bad old days in the back wards of Woodlands and some very poor foster homes and parental care. Are you as happy as I am with the, the way Cradle Haven is now run? Well, Jack, I think that uh, what your half hour showed the other day was an excellent example of custodial care for profoundly handicapped children. And I guess where you and I might differ is that we would uh, not want to have better stand in the way of best. We now know of examples not only in British Columbia but across North America, and I've really made it a personal study to look at examples of family-like environments for the care of profoundly handicapped children and we know that these examples exist the technology is there the teaching techniques are there so I guess what uh, we would want to say is that we think that a whole lot more could be done uh, based on the recommendations uh, of coroner Asker, ASCII I would suggest to you that there is a lot of substance to those recommendations and maybe we'll get a chance to explore some of them. No I'd like you to explore them now as a matter of fact what what are the specific things that I, of course, perhaps from my advancing years and having seen the backwards of Woodlands, regard that as the best example of custodial and emergency care when necessary and some therapy that mm -hmm. I have ever seen. Yeah. yeah, I was pleased to see in the program that an awful lot of changes have been made in the last several months and a lot of progress has happened. I understand from our contacts with government officials that this facility, which was licensed for 32, and had about 26 children living in it when I went to visit it is now down to 20 and my understanding is that MHR has kept the budget at the same rate as it was when it was 26 so that means automatically that there's a more, more money, money to enrich the program and, and the that's staff positive. seemed to be well adjusted and quite bonded in some cases and they had some volunteers and they are doing therapy but what you're telling me perhaps is that given the magic wand of enough money and trained therapists you see let me put it this way I was really quite not taken aback, I kind of expected it. When you see some of these poor wee souls who are 22, 19, and 16, and on the face of it they look 5 or 6 or 8 or 10. Mm -hmm. Now, are you suggesting that as of the birth of a child with those conditions today, that with what is known, that 15 or 16 or 22 years down the road, they would not be in that same condition. Is that what you're telling me? By and large, yes. Explain that to me. Because I think the key is to uh, get in there right at infancy. A lot of these children don't see, they can't see, they're physically handicapped, some of them don't hear, so we have a situation where they have no interaction with the environment. All those things that we know underlie normal development. The children learn to imitate, they learn to become members of society. But what about the deformities which are present in the legs of many of these poor little kids? Early physical therapy can prevent that a lot of the positions that you saw, the distension of the head, these kinds of things can be can be prevented. That's but why Coroner Askey recommended that the staff at Cradle Haven receive training in such areas as positioning and that there be postural inserts and medical equipment available. That is to assist these children to prevent the distortions of the arms and legs that you saw there. The children are not born with those handicaps, Jack. Those develop over the years if they don't get the kind of early intervention and active intervention. Oh, oh, I get the point. If a child is born, say, profoundly retarded, which is a physical thing which can be checked and established. No, you can't. You can't establish profound mental retardation at all. Uh, normally, you would do that on the basis of IQ. Uh, you met children there who don't communicate. But uh, obviously, some of them have, behind that difficulty, yeah. there seem to be bright little minds. That's, That's what you... That's exactly it. That yeah. You hit the nail right on the head. The whole question is, how do we get to that mind? And how do we open up that mind well, to the Well, simply, in the simple therapy, which that delightful girl Claudia right. was doing with her banjo the other day, whatever it was, you could see the 22-year-old boy enjoy himself right. in being recognized. You saw, and you saw that little girl. Yes. And she was laughing. Yes. That's the basis of, of trying now to develop some system of communication. Now, I would certainly agree that Cradle, Cradle Haven is doing the best it can if it follows and is encouraged to follow the recommendations in this. 
Jack, uh, I think we've always maintained that the owners at Cradle Haven have, have been, in fact, doing the best that they can. In fact, I was really quite impressed uh, in my conversations with the owners by the strong medical advocacy that they did on behalf of the children. Mm -hmm. I think it's really a question of uh, how to enrich that program so that the kind of active intervention that uh, Sally is talking about is available at all times. Um, to give you an example, the school system, the recommendation of Coroner Askey with regard to the educational involvement of the local school district, well the woman that you saw there, uh, based, on, based on my uh, research, is basically a child care aid, a chance worker aid attached to the local school district. Traditionally, those people simply help with toileting, with dressing and with feeding. Um, my understanding is that the local school board has put in a proposal to the Ministry of Education in Victoria and they are anticipating having a full-time teacher available in January. Jack, we knew about this situation over a year ago. <laughs> We're still waiting. That's an area of concern. If there was the active involvement of the school system in two ways. One, to bring a well-qualified teacher who believes in the potential of profoundly handicapped children into that setting for those children who can't leave it. And if the children who can move from Cradle Haven into the local schools can go there and there is teaching provided there, we're going to see a major improvement in their abilities. Oh, no, I, I concede that and I'm sure Cradle Haven would concede the same thing and would welcome with open arms any such. Jack, that's not a minor recommendation, that's a major recommendation. Oh no, recommendation. I realize that, you except that when a layman like myself looks at these children in that state, we're not talking about a new crop who might be dealt with totally differently from birth. You think, oh, in the name of goodness, what can you do? Jack, there are families all over this province that we're in touch with on a regular basis who are bringing up their sons and daughters with profound handicaps many, in the communities. You and I both know, and I could document this a thousand times, that there are families who, faced with the tragedy of a mm -hmm. severely handicapped baby, cannot cope. That's certainly true. Destroys the family. One of the ways that it destroys the family is to have no respite care or babysitting mm -hmm. available, Jack. I meet families who after 20 years of being married, husband and wife, have never had, had a, a night out on their own. There's not even that kind of basic support that's a hell of a lot cheaper. Used to be. Well, it's not existent anymore. It's minimal care. P money for equipment, based the kind of equipment that Dr. Askey mentioned for Cradle Haven, is not available for families. The respite care and babysitting, the therapy services, we had to meet with Mrs. McCarthy to get her to withdraw the means testing of the developmental preschools, uh, and that would have been another financial bur burden on okay. natural families. We'll continue with Dr. Rogo and Alec Mansky on Cradle Haven, uh, about which the report says, by the way, on reviewing the individual death, there was no evidence of any neglect, injuries, or oversight which would directly lead to such deaths. On the contrary, ample evidence of concern and the use of all available medical assistance and an aggressive thrust in the overall care. I wanted to make that quite clear because I didn't make it clear in the other program. But what we're going to discuss now is what should be done for families who can cope with profoundly. And there's also another. After the break. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm getting the message here. Cradle Haven does the very best it can with the facilities it has, and hopefully the MHR will give them the recommendations in the report. Jack, we hope so. We, uh, I guess, have taken the stand that we need uh, to have some monitoring to make sure those recommendations are implemented. But, good as it is, Cradle Haven, for instance, does not supply the much fuller service that Sunny Hill Hospital, is that correct? Yeah. What's the difference? Well, um, there is trained, uh, right, first of all, Sunny Hill Hospital has a, uh, an educational uh, class, uh, full-time teachers employed, there's uh, full-time music therapy, full-time physiotherapy and occupational therapy, and more importantly, and this is something that I would like to see at Cradle Haven, is that all of those professionals work together so that you just don't have a music therapist playing a, a banjo for a child and having the child respond, that that is used as the basis for communication so that when the educational consultant comes in that they work on that as well. So it's that coordinated approach to the children's care to assist them in developing. Uh, Sunny Hill has rehab services for certain children but has 25 of the same type of handicapped children, is it not? To the best of my knowledge, and Sally could certainly answer this better. Uh, One of the problems, Jack, is 
who gets called multi-handicapped. You have a tremendous range of abilities, a tremendous mix of, of people under this uh, category. category. And when we talk about profound retardation, what are the measures we're using? We really have no accurate way of assessing capability in children like this until we begin providing services and then being able to see how the children respond so that you have many children who are classified as profoundly multiply retarded who with uh, the development of communication and some of the technology is very exciting here some of the computer technology you suddenly discover that somebody cannot speak but he can communicate and we have a young man now who is reading with the help of a, an Apple computer. He had all that language and understanding sitting in his head and absolutely no way of letting people know comparable what he knew. Comparable perhaps even to one of the children at Cradle That's Haven. Right. That and little girl, that little girl in your segment, that was a very beautiful little mm. piece there. Now she was laughing and enjoying well, she was certainly aware. She do they knew. get this treatment at Sunnyhill? Yes, they do. And they learn uh, bliss. They learn other ways of communicating if they cannot speak. They get uh, speech therapy. They get uh, physiotherapy. All right, now, you're developing a case, which I must put to Atmansky, that ideally, therefore, with a child of this category, whose life prognosis is never that long, am I correct? It's hard to say. Certainly we know that all studies suggest that if you make mobile, a previously immobile population, help these children to move about, they live much, much longer than we've ever expected them. So, but therefore, what you're telling me, and maybe I'm going to try and trap you here, is that the best place is a high-grade Sunny Hill. No, I think that there are two features of Sunny Hill that are, that are critical to understand. First off is that they have the expertise available there so that they can train families and care providers in smaller settings in the community. Sunny Hill cannot duplicate, nor can Cradle Haven, the kind of family env environment that you and I grew up in. Mm -hmm. So that's important. Sunny Hill recognizes that. They're funded by primarily on a rehabilitation rate rather than the custodial rate that Cradle Haven is funded at. Right. Critical difference number one. Critical difference number two is that Sunny Hill has group homes that they streamline the children through so that the children, the, the model for the children is to move out of Sunny Hill Hospital as quickly as possible well, through course. Hartman House back into either the and natural family. Much, and uh, everybody will concede there's a much better opportunity with the Sunny Hill educational rehabilitation developmental positioning, much better chance of getting the child back eventually to a family environment. But you don't need necessarily the technology, Jack. We have foster families up in the cusp. We have people out in the, the rural areas of this province who are caring for profoundly handicapped children, teenagers, and adults. Would it's you really much rather have that for the, the proper foster family care than any form of institution, apart from the training and assessment? I think we would want to avoid a, a one way of doing things. Because as you pointed out, there are families that cannot, cannot cope. cope. And there are a multitude of different kinds of situations. But what we do want to see is uh, who is this child buried underneath all these handicaps? I think society's attitudes sometimes are as big a handicap as any yes, of are. their other handicaps. Oh, can see so that. if we would approach this, mm -hmm. if we take a look at Helen Keller, uh, if she came through the system today, we'd say she's blind, she's deaf, and she's autistic. And the Helen Keller would have been lost. Yeah. And you've only to read her biography all to right. see that. I know. What, uh, what's required? What is, I mean, especially in a time of restraint where you're going to find it very difficult to get money. Make it's things. a reallocation. It's not more money. It's a different emphasis. It's an emphasis on support services. It's an emphasis on the training of personnel, the training of staff. And then you save a lot of money at the other end with your what, total uh, care facilities. What, what, what do you feel from the government? And this is a matter which I'm sure is largely nonpartisan. Well, nobody would disagree with the concepts expressed here this morning. Well, uh, we see uh, a lot of discussion and talk about supporting the family and going into smaller privatized settings, Jack, but the reality is that the majority of money that our government spends in the care of handicapped children and adults goes into maintaining institutional environments. So we have a time lag 
between what I hope government wants to do and certainly what we want to have to see happen and what in reality is it happening because the drain the allocation of expenditures is still into the institutional environment could I just add a point about the dollars it's not a major expenditure if you looked at the numbers of profoundly handicapped children in this province it would be less than a fraction of one percent of the number of people who are mentally handicapped in BC it's a small number of people and the kinds of studies and work that Sally Rogo done in just in this province demonstrates that it's well worth pouring a few extra dollars for a small number of children so that we can ensure that they develop to their potential. Could we cope with all the children who are affected? Yes, I think we could. But I think we have to, to plan. I think what we have now is a kind of crisis model. We're always responding to the child who's who needs this service and who needs that service. And we kind of what better rush than it was, in, but I can see the deficiencies in, and the defects. Instead of anticipating the needs, we know what these needs are. And we need to have them in place and make them well, available. Well, I'll tell you what, I'd like to see this child who can do a little thing on this child with a computer. Is that possible? Yes. Is, is the, this child in a home? No, he's in a school. In a school. At Sunny Hill? No, at GF Strong. Good. Well, let's do that. And at least we can show how a so-called believe it. And then there are also children at Sunny Hill who are operating the same way. And the uh, whole bliss system of, of communication. Yeah, I don't like doing these stories, but I push myself into doing them from time to time. Very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Alec Mansky and Dr. Sally Rogo. Thank you. Back to our Friday morning mood after the break. A new character haunts the halls of BC Television in Burnaby as he busily, uh, he's on the air already as a matter of fact, and uh, he's, remember last year it was Thick, year before it was Hamill, Hamill was that his name? Yeah. And now my old friend Don Harron is doing the Harron Show. So what do we do? We pick up our little camera, our Kodak, and we walk in on the Harron Show. My privileges around this particular television station are few indeed, but one of them is that I have the dignity, the luxury, and the prestige of a green room. But lately, my green room has been occupied by invaders from outer space. Well, not quite. It's a show which is on Monday through Friday all across this country and which is a riotous success and has a most unlikely host for it, but a man wh whom I've known for a fair number of years and who, considering his background, is remarkably bright. Now, where is he? Don, are you taking over my show? Don, if you want to take over my show, I'll take over your show. Furthermore, I'll do your show for half the money I get for my show. Now, Don Harron of Morningside, what in the name of all that's holy are you doing in my green room? Having a great time, let me tell you. Getting dressed up wearing a tie, shaving every day, what can, and sleeping in I don't believe you. I don't believe it's Charlie Farkerson. <laughs> <laughs> which is which? Which which is which? Will, will the real Charlie Don please stand up? Well, well, Charlie can say anything. Don has to be very careful. Tell me, though, yeah. after all your years of delicacy, sophistication, and culture... <laughs> Where was that? <laughs> Morningside! Morningside! They wouldn't even give me a chance in Morningside. What about come? the Stratford Festival with the Shakespeare? Uh, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women are merely exits and entrances, and all that sort of stuff. Well, that's our, that's our Charlie Farkless, and that's not our Don Harron. Tell me, you Charlie's on this show? Charlie's on this oh, show? Yeah, well, once every week or so, he comes on and uh, interrupts me, and uh, I go and shave and run back and apologize for his presence to the pollution agency. Now, you've got to do your research for this show. You've got to read People magazine. That's right. You've got to read the National Enquirer. Yes, and I have to phone my lawyer, too. On many occasions. As a matter of fact, it's much the same research as I do, because you've been in show business a little shorter than I've been, haven't you? Longer. Nah, I don't when believe When did you it. start? 1933. I started 34. Yeah. Feet. <laughs> show me who's on the show today, will you? Yeah, Murray McLaughlin's on the show. Ben oh, Wicks. You Murray know ben McLaughlin. Wicks? Oh, you mean the singer? Yeah. Murray McLaughlin. The farmer's song. I understand that one of the ugliest men in Canada is presently in makeup. 
Turn no, 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 we've both got makeup on. Wait, oh. Turn your back on the camera, we'll walk in, we'll, we'll take a profile of him. He looks better Come on there, John. Okay, let's go into the makeup room regardless. Now introduce your guest to me first of all, the man in the chair first. This is the ugly man you were talking about? <laughs> this is Ben Wicks, the handsome, debonair, dashing, cartoonist, nationally syndicated. Move out of the way. I don't want to spoil his profile. Joanna, would you stand back a second? Would you come down and get the delicacy and oh. shape? Yes, please. This is the man who once advocated bringing his kind of English stock out, the aristocracy of the working class, to breed upper-class Canadian women. Was that right? Right. Six aristocrats to breed with selected Canadian females. How successful the were you? Disaster. Disaster. I was the only one that did any interbreeding in the end. <laughs> Don't tell me you've got another book you're flogging. Another book. A very important book. A dog. Dog books. Nothing to do with the books I've already written. No, it's a very, very important book. My most important book. Is it your most important book? Well, I hope so. I hope it's the biggest seller, actually. <laughs> it's a thin one. It sells cheaply. No, but there's big, big letters in there. Very big letters that, uh, that makes it look thin, but it's, now it's when, very good. When you're on the Harlem show, will you try and keep it clean? I'm going to this time. He asked me, so I'm going to attempt to do it. Don't that. tell our story. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. I won't. I should keep that from him. Ben, nice to see you. Is that it? How tall are I you? I thought we were going to talk about the dog book. Just a minute. How tall are you when you're standing up? Four, Four feet six? No, five feet. 11, I think it is now, something he, like that. He's a lovable little <laughs> spaniel, isn't he? But here is someone my wife absolutely would be delighted to meet. How are you? Very good, thank you. You're Bobby. Some of the time. Your real name in General Hospital. Bobby Spencer is my name on General and Hospital. And your real name off General Hospital. Jacqueline Zeman. Well, you know, I'm on General <laughs> Hospital doing a little editorial in the afternoons, and I hate to interrupt all your sex. You do? Yeah, because you have a fair amount of sex you in come General Hospital. You come out in the middle of General Hospital? That's right. And I'm fully clothed, and I'm not involved in drugs or prostitution or Soviet spies. Neither am I anymore. You used to be. <laughs> what was your role in General Hospital, you gorgeous little creature? I play a nurse, a registered nurse, uh, an ex-prostitute, uh, reformed. I was a very bad girl for about two years, and now I've become... Pretty terrific person, I think. And your auntie was just the madam. That's right, Aunt Ruby. Um, who was latest to be shot, killed? How many Soviet spies are there on that program? Quite a few. Uh, the latest, the last one to be killed. Who? I don't even know who the last one to be killed is. But Grant. Uh, Grant is still alive, right? I, I hope the goodies win. Do you think they will? Well, the good guys always win. Are you Aren't you a baddie in General Hospital? Not anymore. No, I'm a good girl. You're a good girl, man. Good girl. I'll make sure you stay as such. <laughs> and regards from Margaret Webster, one of your greatest fans. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, if you'll move your beautiful legs, <laughs> I'll get back to Don. This must be a real joy for you, Don. It away is. from it is because I, I I have breakfast first, and I and I'm finished by a time when I can have dinner. I miss lunch, which means I took off all the weight I lost last year on my book tour. Mm. There's only one person missing from the show today. Catherine McKinnon? Yeah. She'll be out later. Where's she was out last week uh, and visiting the show because she was doing the World Conference on Multiple Sclerosis. She's the spokesperson for that disease. Mm -hmm. But she's going to come back and sing. And she's going to bring her sister, Patricia Ann. Still I was a two-time winner in cancer. Donald, best of luck in your show. Yes. I know you'll be better than the other people who did it before you. I won't mention their names. I hope to be as good. I want you to be better, and I'm sure you will. Try. My thanks yes. very much. My special thanks to you. Little kissy. Oh, blimey, this is probably something much want to throw up. <laughs> much obliged, Carrie. I'm telling you all the best. After the break. No, I know. Well, that was good fun. Here is a memo to all soccer bowl ticket holders. If you are an early ticket holder, that is, if you bought your ticket last July, your tickets will tell you inaccurately that the soccer bowl game starts at 6 p.m. tomorrow night. That is a mistake. A mistake the soccer bowl committee says it has already given wide publicity about. But the game actually starts at 4 p.m. The computer that printed the tickets, <laughs> they've got to have something to blame. The computer that printed the tickets made the mistake. It wasn't a computer. 
to somebody that programmed the computer. So don't be confused. Go at four, not a six, or you will be in a soccer ball fix. <laughs> I wish the crew would laugh around here. They're such hypocrites. Most of the time, they've got faces that would turn milk sour. Give them a little laugh and they giggle. A little of a light-hearted or a heavy-hearted or whatever kind of free-for-all you would like to help me pass the time with a smile on my... You know, I'm more than just a pretty face. After the break. Personally, I think I look dreadful in this grey suit, but they tell me it looks better on television. The reason I have a desk, of course, is so you can't see my pot belly all the time. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Good that morning. camera is too low. Hello. Far too low. Good morning. Good morning. Jack, what I would like to say with without... Prejudice. See? See how the double chin vanishes? That's where I want the camera. Yes, go ahead, please. All right, now? Okay. Yes. Without prejudices, without uh, disgrace. I wonder why we spend the money we do on the retarded children. As a young boy, five years of age, I went past the incurable hospital in Toronto many, many years ago. I remember my father saying, what are we spending the money for? I do not disrespect them. But why are we spending the money we do on those children when there is no physical evidence whatsoever that the return to society, the money that's well spent? I will hang up and I'll hear your recarts. Thank you. Thank you. What am I going to say to that? You know what he's saying. No, I can't go for that. Many's the time I've seen children supposedly incurably retarded, and you see that, are treated as such, that bright little spark in the eyes. It's a measure of the civilization, how much money, time, and effort we're going to do to help those of the underprivileged in our society. Didn't want to be that serious. Go ahead, please. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that Chief Mulligan would be very, very happy to understand that your senility is showing. Thank you, sir. I didn't cut that off because of the reference to my senility. Everybody knows I'm senile. But I was nervous about the way that guy would continue the call, not with respect to me. You may say what you like about me, but kindly don't tie me into other public or former public figures, because I don't know what you're going to say. Uh, where are you speaking from? Yes, from Abbotsford. From where? Abbotsford. Oh, yes. Good morning, Abbotsford. Yes, I'd like to address uh, Mr. Hansen's uh, uh, comments about uh, the moving expense charges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And has anybody stopped to look into the, uh, how much it does cost to move from Ontario to here? It costs $10,000. At least. <laughs> well, I don't object to it, but I like these things to be pointed out. Right. Because it, uh, it's much higher than $10,000 for an ad average family, actually. Oh, yeah. If you get a moving company to move you across the street, they'll nick you for 1800 That's right. 2000 That's right. Oh, no. No, no. It's I just that... that I, don't most, I don't think most people realize that, that's all. You know, I, like, I just like to get all the little bits you can get out. It's nice to know that uh, Bob McClellan, for whom I have some respect, but just by the way, yeah. spent 100 nights in the Hotel Vancouver, and he bargained for a rate between 45 and 60 Right. Much obliged. Okay. No complaints. Just like to know. Good morning. Good morning, Jack. Um, I'm a parent, or actually a step-parent of three autistic children. Mm -hmm. And I would like to uh, reiterate what the people said earlier about uh, the ability to get services. <laughs> it's certainly getting worse. I started off as a foster parent to these children, so I know the services that a foster parent of special needs children gets. Mm -hmm. And now I know <clears throat> the lack of services of a natural parent because that's what I'm considered now. Mm -hmm. And it just seems to me that the whole thing is, is uh, set up to pressure parents into putting their children into institutions or into foster homes because the services are much better there. There's got to be a combination of it somewhere where a child is properly treated at birth, is properly assessed and diagnosed, and that the proper facilities be made available, preferably in the home, in due course. 
That would actually be a lot cheaper. <laughs> That's what they tell me. But once you're committed to any kind of juggernaut of an institutional system, it's difficult to break away, although we are breaking away from it now. Things are so much better than they were. Oh, they are, because I know I am a, a, a trained psychiatric nurse and trained at Riverview and uh, then worked at Woodlands, oh, I hate to say, 17 years ago or so, and then worked at Glendale. And uh, that there was about eight years between those two. And uh, the improvement was quite vast, but of course those are institutions, you know, and... Oh. and uh, I truly don't believe in, in children in institutions, no matter what condition they're in. They Ma'am, thank you. I appreciate the problem. I really do. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. Could Hello. You tell me what happened to that absolutely fascinating and interesting man from SFU that used to be on your show? I can't remember his name. Neither can I, and I don't want to. Oh, why would you? John Crisper was very good. I enjoyed him thoroughly on the program. Uh, he went back. He completed his years... Uh, junk it out here for the Chevron seat of something or other. Mm -hmm. uh, and a very bright guy doing very well in Toronto. And he and I were together briefly on the CTV national broadcast at the election of the man with the big chin. Mm -hmm. But Crispo was very well and very happy, making lots of money. A uh, superior member of the academic elite, you know, who really never has to do a day's work in his life, I about which I am rather jealous. I hope you get him back as a guest now and then. I shall do. Thank you, sir. John Crispo. Crispo, right. Crispo. Thanks a lot. Handsome little devil he was with curly hair. <laughs> Hello. Good morning, Jack, and how are you this morning? I'm pretty bleeding good this morning. Nah, it's good, sir. I watch your show quite often, and I like to see the big pot, and uh, I also like to see the uh, the little fellow with the big paddle. Cause Who's the little fellow with the big paddle? You are. You oh, you I'm not a little fellow. I used to be five, ten, a half. I've shrunk to 5'10". My weight has been constant for 10 years. Uh, and I'm not going to give you it in pounds. Yeah, but if, if you can't keep it going, you can't make people think. But anyway, there was a, another fellow commenting a little earlier on the retarded children and what they, what society could get out of them, eh? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think he's pretty sick. And I do think that if one of his children or if he himself had been in that position, I think that his values might have changed quite a bit. Here, here's her. Could not agree with you more. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Morning, sir. I'd like to say your show is both entertaining, informative. I tremendously enjoyed your interview with Pierre Burton. I'd like to see him on again. And the editorial you gave, I believe, on yesterday's news on the current state of things in Victoria was probably the best. I have heard since, who's the gentleman that does the comment on the uh, CTV Late Night News? Bruce Phillips. Bruce Phillips, right. If he ever uh, resigns, take over. No, 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 no. Jack, maybe that way we'll get some things done. No. Much obliged. Very nice call. Have a good day. You too. Time for one quick call. Quick, qu quick one. Quickly, quickly. Oh, good morning, Jack. Morning. Yeah, I'd like to bring you back to Margaret Thatcher's visit to Canada. We've only got 15 seconds. Okay, I, 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 I find it offensive that she would uh, interfere in domestic politics, i.e. Uh, the cruise missile. I think it's, you know, I just think it's wrong. I think the foreign minister of Germany did the same thing when he came over here. That's right. Maybe you've got a good point there, but then I might stop and I shall be back after the break. I'm going to look at the federal political scene Monday morning. It's the one thing we're going to be doing through the eyes of that very outspoken Ron Huntington. A couple of things with Ron. Mark Rose of the NDP will drop in. We're going to look at the cons how the consumer has been affected by restraint legislation. All at 9 a.m. Monday, precisely. 